So we are going to talk about the supremum and infimum and why they are useful. Let's say we have this set consisting of the elements one, one half, one third, and one fourth. What is the minimum element in this set? Well, obviously one fourth. That's going to be the smallest number in this set. And anytime we have a finite set, there will always be a smallest element. But what if we consider the set one, one half, one third, one fourth, one fifth, one sixth, and so on, all the way to infinity? In other words, this is the set of numbers one over n for every n greater than or equal to one. Now, what is the minimum of this set? Well, all of these numbers in here are bigger than zero and they're going to get really, really, really close to zero. But none of these numbers actually equals zero. So we can't say that the minimum of this set is zero because zero isn't even in the set in the first place. But we really want to say that something like the minimum of this set is zero. So how exactly can we generalize the idea of minimum so that it gets the right answer for this set. Well, if our goal is to generalize the definition of minimum, we need to make sure that our generalization gets the right answer in cases where a set actually does have a minimum. So let's say we're considering some set S, which has a minimum M, which is an element of the set. Then what are some of the properties of this number M? Well, one key property of the minimum is that it is a lower bound on the elements of S. In other words, because M is the smallest element of S, there can't be an element of S smaller than M. So for every number S in our set, we have M less than or equal to S. This is what it means for M to be a lower bound on the set S. Now, when we talk about the minimum of a set, the other property we want is that this number is actually in the set itself. But our goal is to generalize the minimum to cases where it's not an element of the set. So is there a way to talk about the properties of the minimum that doesn't actually say that it's in the set? Here's one way to do it. There is no lower bound greater than M. And the reason this is true is because M is an element of the set. So let's say we have some number L that's bigger than M. The definition of a number being a lower bound on the set S is that it's less than or equal to every element of S. Now M is an element of S. So for a number to be a lower bound on the set S, it has to be less than or equal to M. So if L is greater than M, then it can't be a lower bound on S, which means that there is no lower bound that's greater than M. So M is the greatest lower bound on S. So we've now proved that if a set S has some minimum element M, then M is the greatest lower bound on that set S. But what if we don't have a minimum? Well, instead of talking about the minimum, we can look at this thing right here, the greatest lower bound. Because if there's a minimum, then finding the greatest lower bound will always give us the correct answer because the minimum is the greatest lower bound. But if there's no minimum, then sometimes there will still be a greatest lower bound. For example, let's look at our setup here. We know that this set has a lower bound of zero because zero is less than or equal to everything in the set. And if we take any number bigger than zero, then eventually we'll be able to find some number one over n that's smaller than that number eventually one over n is less than every positive number. So no positive number can be a lower bound on this set, which means that zero is the greatest lower bound for our set over here. 
So we've successfully generalized the definition of minimum to get the right answer for this set. Now when we talk about this idea of the greatest lower bound, instead of using the word minimum, we use the word infimum. So this word right here means greatest lower bound. And if we're looking at some set S, we usually denote the infimum of S by INF of S. So if this is our set S right here, then INF of S equals zero. We can do a similar thing for maximums. It's going to follow the exact same reasoning, but if we're looking at a maximum instead of a minimum, then what we get is the least upper bound. So it's the same idea, except we're coming from above instead of from below. So if we look at the least upper bound on a set, then that's called the supremum of the set. So supremum is a generalization of max, and infimum is a generalization of min. But you might ask, how good are these generalizations? In other words, we know that the infimum lets us talk about values for sets that don't actually have a minimum value. But does every set have an infimum? Well, not every set, because if we look at, for example, the set of integers, there's no smallest value because the numbers keep going all the way out to negative infinity. So there isn't even a lower bound to talk about. But it turns out that if we're looking at sets of real numbers, then every set with a lower bound also has a greatest lower bound. And similarly, every set with an upper bound has a least upper bound. So anytime we're looking at a set that's bounded, the supremum and infimum will always be defined. So this lets us generalize the ideas of max and min to sets where the biggest and smallest values aren't actually attained in the set.